Well, hello. Many things going on. I hope you all had a great uh, Labor Day weekend. Um, that is when we are filming this as of uh, Tuesday after Labor Day. So I, there are a number of things that have come up over the last few days that I'd like to address. Um, one thing I'd like to address is there are some posts out there right now. I don't, listen, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade. And I get that everybody's excited and waiting and hoping that, hey, this year might be the year for um, the rapture. And it might be during the fall season. It might be um, during Yom Teru this year. I get that. You know, it's a high watch season. Um, but sometimes... You know, I've I've cautioned this before. Um, we start looking through the weeds and pulling up just about anything that we can find um, in desperation, and uh, we want to keep it biblical. I think that's the caution um, that I always like to uh, to use. And one of those is um, from Revelation chapter twelve. Let me. Um, let me go ahead and, and pull this up just because, because why not? Um, let's, let's take a quick look there. There's a lot out there right now about this asteroid called the child. And folks are hoping and everything that this is a big sign. And there are some um, popular um, YouTube type preachers out there who are promoting this thing as a, as a big sign from heaven. And the reason why is Revelation 12. We know this Revelation 12 sign happened. Um, it looked very much like it in 2017, and it could be. I just don't think it was about the rapture. I didn't think at the time that it was necessarily about the rapture. Of course, you know, you hope you're wrong and you hope that, you know, something's going to happen. But let's look at a couple things. Let's look at what the Revelation 12 thing is really telling us, at least some of it. And um, then there's a lot going on right now about the child, this asteroid called the child that it, some people are um, going into hysterics over. Okay, let's take a measured look at this. Okay. And uh, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. This we get from Genesis. This is the story of Joseph, his dream. Remember, he had this dream, and uh, we had a couple of dreams, but this is one of the dreams he had. And so his brothers became very angry at him because he was saying, yeah, and, you know, and, and um, you know, everybody was bowing down to me. And, and uh, even Joseph's dad, um, Jacob, was upset because... You know, this whole thing of, yeah, yeah, you'll be bowing down to me too. Well, ultimately, in the short term, that was fulfilled in Joseph's life as he was the number two man um, to Pharaoh in Egypt. Um, everybody thought Joseph was dead, and he turned out to be not dead. You recall the story. So they were all hungry. Israel was hungry. So they came to Egypt, and um, Joseph was able to help them out. Of course, Many decades later, new leadership takes over, new pharaoh. They forget all about those relationships between Joseph and um, that pharaoh and all of Joseph's brothers. They forget about that, and they became worried because of how Israel was multiplying, and they were like grasshoppers, and we need to, we need to nip this in the bud and corral this or... They're going to take over. So they enslaved Israel in Egypt. Um, so that happened. And that was part of the whole reason why you needed um, Moses to come along and lead them out. But um, once again, I digress. So this story here is an exact picture of what you see Joseph saw in his dream concerning um, Joseph, concerning Israel. And a gray sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. So this is Israel. She was pregnant, was crying out in birth pains, 
and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems or crowns. Now, um, historically, in the short term, remember, you, prophetically, very often there's a near and a far fulfillment. In the near fulfillment, we did see the fulfillment of this in the person of, of Christ and and um, Mary in her particular position. She was never clothed with the sun and a crown of 12 stars, but figuratively out of eat, out of Israel came the Messiah, right? The sun, this particular sun. And, um, but what happened was, it was Satan using Herod and, and uh, other devices, of course, to slaughter many children in, in an effort to get rid of this promised Messiah. So that happened, and it was similar also on Moses' day, and that was a type of Christ as well. Um, so this uh, great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns is figured in the scripture in a few different places, right? Now, not really a few, a couple places. This is one of them. Um, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Now, we can look at this through um, a, those. Uh, there are a couple of Old Testament passages that you should be familiar with about the fall of Lucifer when he and one third of the angels tried to overthrow God. Ridiculous. And then they were they were kicked out of heaven. So anyway, we have the, the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child one who is to rule all the nations with the rod of iron. This is clearly about Christ because we know this from language from the Old Testament, right? Him ruling with a rod of iron. Um, but her child was caught up to God to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she uh, has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. And is typical of prophetic language you can be in, in, in the moment, you can be in the near fulfillment, and then all of a sudden there's a break in the narrative, and now you're talking about the future. And, and this even happened with Christ with his first coming. And I, I, I like to use the example. Um, there's a couple of exa examples I like to use, but one of them is Gabriel going to Mary and saying, look, you know, you're with child, and, and this is who this child is, and when he comes, this is what he's going to do. And... Um, then he's going to sit on the throne of David and he's going to reign and rule, you know, with a rod of iron kind of a thing. So um, you had Jesus show up and she was pregnant with Jesus, but but ruling, sitting on, on the throne of David does not happen. It hasn't happened yet. And we're still waiting for that 2,000 years roughly later, approximately. Um, so this is what happens with prophecy. So we, we have this dragon and he's before the woman Israel, um, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. He attempted this literally with Jesus um, in, a, a, in a fashion 2,000 years ago. Um, she gave birth to a male child, one is to rule, and that was Jesus. All the nations with a rod of iron, still Jesus, talking about the millennial kingdom now, were flashing forward. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne, and this happened at his ascension. And the woman fled into the wilderness where um, she has a place prepared by God in which she was to be nourished for 1260 days or basically in a, in a biblical calendar year, three and a half years. What, 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 is, what does that mean now? Well, all of a sudden we're getting to this in-between place where we got Jesus was uh, caught up to his throne and then we're flash forwarding to um, the woman fleeing into the wilderness. So Israel did have to flee into the wilderness um, in the year 70 AD, but for three and a half years or 1260 days, well, it was a lot, a lot longer than that, wasn't it? In fact, she never really came back. Israel never really came back. They attempted in about 135 to come back into the land, and um, Caesar was, at the time, was having none of that, ran them off with the Roman armies, ran them off. It was a little bit of a, quite a, a skirmish, quite a battle there. Ran them out and then he plowed the land under, plowed Jerusalem under, and renamed it now and called it, you know, basically it's Palestine. And that's how Israel came to be called Palestine. Um, historically, there is no Palestine except by edict 
from Caesar when he ran Israel out the second time, but they never really came back. So when they came back in 135, so the year 70 AD to 135 is more than 1260 days. So what's this? Well, we're talking about a different time. This is different than 70 AD because they took off into the wilderness. Many of them scattered, as was foretold in the Old Testament, they'd be scattered to every country. And um, and they were, and they did not come back. They did not begin coming back really until 1948 when Israel became a nation again. No more um, just that whole land being called Palestine. Now Israel is back. They had that little wedge of property for a while there, and it's grown since then. But it's a lot more than 1,260 days. So now we're talking about something unique. Now we're flashing forward into um, the tribulation period. And this is, in particular, the middle of the tribulation is what we're talking about here. So um, what happens is, is uh, Satan is still at work. I'm trying to devour the woman and her and her child or and her children. The child we can we can um, debate what that's about. Her offspring. Some people will say, well, it's referring to the church. You know, well, the church is already gone. Um, the bride of Christ is not going to be here on the earth at this time for the bridegroom to rain his wrath down on his own bride. It's not going to happen. We are not appointed into wrath. And if you have questions about that, again. And we'll, we can go through this again at some point. I know I promised I did, and I haven't yet. But um, First Thessalonians chapters four and five. Read that, and you'll see that that is not something that is for His church. Also, Rev, Revelation three ten, very important verse. Revelation three ten about how there's a time of of trial or trouble that's coming upon the whole world. And and I, I had a guy just yesterday saying, well, we, we've always had trouble and tribulations. Even Jesus had tribulation, but there's a particular tribulation that Jesus referred to in Matthew 24. And he says, he said, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, and he's talking about a specific time and a specific passage, Daniel 9, 27, where Gabriel came in in Daniel chapter 9 and talked about um, 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined for, for you, for Israel. And there's 70 weeks of years. And in Daniel 9.27, there's a particular week of years, which a week is a group of seven. So there's a seven-year tribulation where in the middle, the abomination of desolation is going to come and desecrate the temple. Okay, Jesus now in Matthew 24 references this and talks about, so, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of, you know, flee into the wilderness get out of Dodge kind of a thing. So um, Jesus is telling them that that's, that that's going to happen. And so um, now we get into Revelation chapters 12, 13, and we start seeing these events actually playing out. We are told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that this man of sin is going to come. He's going to stand up in the temple and he's going to declare himself God. And uh, you know, that, that's all of those kinds of events. The man of sin is going to come upon the scene. And we know that it's in the middle of the tribulation. It's in the middle of the book of Revelation right here, chapter 12. So it's this that we're looking at. So we're looking at uh, God is going to nourish um, this remnant of Israel, flee into the wilderness for 1260 days or three and a half years. So Zoom off. Many people think to Petra. Zoom off to Petra. God's going to nurse him. So the, Satan, um, Antichrist might be trying to reign, rule at that time, um, and trying to take over Israel and trying to nuke them, trying to devour the child, launching missiles, whatever, and it's not going to get through because um, no weapon formed against them will prevail. This is the uh, uh, Jeremiah prophecy. Um, you might look at that and have that as a nice poster in your house. Um, but we, the church, it's not that particular passage is specifically, very specifically for Israel. Um, God does protect his. He protects us here in the church as well as the true believers. But that particular passage is he's directing it at Israel to let them know that he will be protecting them. And so 
she's going to flee into the wilderness for three and a half years. So we know that this is the midpoint. So now war arose in heaven. So this is what John is trying to explain. This is what's going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. Um, now, I, I believe that this is really what the Revelation 12 sign is. And, and it could have happened in 2017. What happened in 2017, Dave? Well, 2017, war arose in heaven. So now Satan knows it's the final push. And he's he and um, the Lord's angels are, are up there battling now. We've always had spiritual warfare. We have spiritual warfare here. We know that this earth is, uh, is Satan's domain for now, ever since the curse, the fall. Uh, Satan is like a lion in the streets, roaring in the streets, seeking whom he may devour. He's called the god of this age, um, or the god of this world, the prince of the power of the air. Um, we know that he's ever before the throne of grace, the throne of God, accusing. He's the accuser of the devil, accusing the saints, saying, hey, God, look at what they're doing down there. Look at this, this, this person over there. He did this with Job. We see this in Job chapters 1 and 2. So now, uh, if we kind of know, we get an inkling of how close the end time is. Do you think maybe Satan has a pretty good idea too when the season is? So I think if uh, this Revelation 12 sign happened in 2017, this was probably what the Revelation 12 sign was really about, about um this plan of God is plan of redemption, and uh, we've we've got the woman Israel, and we've got this uh, delivery about to happen, and um, God is going to have to rescue her. Satan is going to be in his final push to try to destroy the people of God and trying to ruin God's plans once, once again, and but God's going to protect her and nourish her. So now we get. A particular dynamic going on here and that's now war rose in heaven michael and his angels fighting against the dragon the dragon is satan right and the dragon and his angels fought back that makes it clear yes absolutely satan that's who the red dragon was with the ten horns it's interesting but he was defeated and there was no longer a place for them in heaven so um satan when he's sent out they are going to defeat the devil and his angels and um, in a figure of speech, in a manner of speaking, um, Satan's wings and all the demons' wings, they're going to be clipped. No longer access to the throne to accuse the saints. They're kicked down to earth. So, you know, Michael, God has had enough of it. Says, Michael, go take care of my light. Wait for me. <laughs> so they fight. We don't know how long this battle is. That's the thing. So it could have happened, began in 2017 and it's still going on now. And it's going to go on until the middle of the tribulation. So what happens in the middle of the tribulation? Satan is kicked down. What happens when Satan's kicked down? So he's the great dragon. He's thrown down the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan. Very clear now who, who the dragon is. See, this is how symbolism most of the time works in Scripture. We don't need to come up with all this weird stuff and all these numbers that mean all these things symbolically. We're told what the seven heads are. And we're told what the ten horns are in a couple different places in Scripture. So we don't need to guess at this. And we're told who the dragon is, who's got the seven heads and the ten horns. He, he owns them. He possesses them. Um, so we know who he is. We know what this is about. He's thrown down to the earth, and his angels are thrown down with him. So by the way, that's where we've the, we get the first mention of the beast, really, actually, chapter 11. So let's, let's get the picture of this. We're in the middle of the tribulation. The two witnesses have been on the earth witnessing. You've got the 144,000 witnesses. The, um, the, the two witnesses are in Jerusalem. And if anybody speaks against them, comes against them, whatever, they open their mouths and fire comes out or fire comes down from heaven, whatever, they can't be touched. You know, in my opinion, um, based on what we see and in the context of the Mount of Transfiguration, it's Elijah and Moses. That's the two witnesses. The Lord's going to allow them to come back down, and that's going to be his two witnesses. You look at the, the plagues they bring and calling down fire from heaven like, Eli like Elijah did and so forth, and it, it reads very much like them. And that's who Jesus showed his disciples to. He says, he told his disciples, you, you're not all going to die before you see the end. 
And they said, what, what does that mean? It's, he's coming back. No, obviously Jesus did not come back 2,000 years ago, but Jesus took them up onto the mountain, Mount of Transfiguration, and says, ta-da, this is a glimpse at the end. And they got to see into heaven at this gateway. And there was uh, Elijah and Moses. And I don't know how they knew who that was. They, they probably didn't have a name tag here that said, hello, my name is Elijah. Or hello, my name is Moses. The Lord divinely imparted that knowledge to them and showed them who they were. Because I'm sure they didn't have a lot of photos around to see what they looked like, right? So I think that's the way it's going to be when we go to heaven someday is we're going to look at long lost relatives or we're going to run into Adam and go, hey, you're Adam, right? Because God's going to show us and show them who each other are. We're going to know who we are because God's going to impart that knowledge to us. That's my opinion. But anyway, um, in chapter 11, so what we got is this scene here um, where I believe John is picking up the slack and what's going on. Let's, let's, let's go back over here. So John started off here talking about the two witnesses because he's looking at the temple. He's trying to catch us up with some of the events that are going on. Um, leading in the lead up to so much happens at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, which is in the middle. So in chapter 11 here, we've got um, the uh, the two olive trees, the two lampstands, the two witnesses, uh, and no one's allowed to harm them. Okay, and um, so then what we have is uh, verse 7, okay, right here, when they finish your testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit, and we know who that is. It's the guy who comes and goes from the bottomless pit, and he goes before the throne, right? Accusing. Will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. So Satan is kicked down to the earth. In my opinion, that's what he's getting ready to back up and tell about in chapter 12. So he says, he's, he's allowed to come out and make war on them, and he's going to kill them. And their dead bodies are going to lie in the street of the great city. That symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt, where the Lord was crucified. Let you know that that's Jeremiah. No, not Jeremiah. Jerusalem. My brain is going too fast. If you have too much of this, impossible. So, Satan is kicked out of, out of, uh, out of heaven. And the, one of the first things he does since he's kicked down to the earth is... He is permitted, we read in, in uh, Revelation 13 and in Revelation 14, we see this where he's permitted, he, he, will, um, he will take over the Antichrist's body, he will possess the Antichrist, just as Satan did Judas. Here, I believe the dragon, he's kicked down to the, to the earth and he's going to possess Satan, the Antichrist, and that's how he becomes the beast because he's this amalgamation of the Antichrist and now possessed by Satan. So once you have Antichrist, it's bad enough, but now he's directly possessed by Satan. Now he's the beast. So um, he's thrown down to earth. Uh, his angels are thrown down with him, and I heard a voice in heaven. So he's on earth, and he's at the temple looking at this. And uh, now the salvation and power of the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ have come for the accuser of the brothers, Satan, right? He's the accuser, has been thrown down, who accuses him day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony, for they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for, and this is one of the woes, right? This is like the last woe. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. So Satan's been kicked down. He possesses Antichrist because he knows his time is short. He knows it's, it's just a great tribulation. He knows what's going to happen. You think he has read the Bible? He's probably got that sucker memorized and he knows it better than you and I. Okay. When the dragon saw he'd been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman going after this remnant in Israel who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given 
the two wings of a great eagle, eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness. Now, this is language that we find in the book of Exodus, where Israel flies into the wilderness and flees from Egypt. So, no, it doesn't, it's not about airplanes. The great eagle with wings is not about the United States sending airplanes in or the big guppy airplanes in to give them an airlift. Uh, God just speeds their path. It's Again, and you can find this. This is the same language that's used in the book of Exodus. Okay, You don't need to read more into it than what it says. Um, so she flies from the serpent. Again, that's the serpent, the dragon. Same serpent, though, as the garden. Into the wilderness, the place where she's be nourished for time, times, and half a time. So that's another way of saying 1,260 days or three and a half years. The serpent... Um, Poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. Now that's just orders. He's giving orders for his army, a flood of uh, people. It's his army to go after her, pursue her, just like Pharaoh did. Get them. I, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to let them just get away with this. Go get them. And Moses had parted the Red Sea and was on his way through. And they had just about all gotten through. And, um, you know, Pharaoh decided, you know what? The heck with this. No, they can't get by with this. Go get them. So the serpent opens his mouth like a flood, sends them. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth. Now, we know that this is figurative language because the earth doesn't have a mouth. But we know we've seen this in the Bible before where the earth split open and swallowed some people, right? Um, and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. Swallows the army. <laughs> Ah, well, and they go falling in. I'm getting excited here and knocking my microphone around. So the, the dragon became furious with the woman. Now he's really mad. And he went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. So this is um, other, uh, not all of Israel leaves. We know from reading Zechariah that um, I think it's one third of a remnant is all who leaves, actually leaves. Uh, actually, half of Israel, I believe Zechariah says, and then one-third of, of Jerusalem leaves. But this also probably refers to the saints, all the believers. Now, a lot of this remnant who leave, I'm, I believe all of this remnant who leave are believers. They are the believing remnant. These are Jews who now have said, you know what? It was about Jesus. Those two witnesses were right. Look at this guy, and he just desecrated the temple. And they put up a statue, a false prophet comes in and brings a statue, and we see this in chapter 13. And the beast chapter starts there in chapter 13 and goes, you know, we see a little bit in chapter 13 and 14. So they see this and they know that this, this, those guys weren't lying. This really, this guy really is a false messiah. messiah. We've been duped. And Jesus was really the guy, so they repent. Well, now they're fleeing, and now we've got... Also, other believers, other Gentile believers, and, I, and um, some of them probably go into Petra as well. Some make it, some don't. Some convert afterwards. So he becomes furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her, the rest of her offspring. On who? Those who keep the commandments of God, so those are believers, and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. So there he is on the beach, on the shore, and he's uh, dominating. So this is what he does. So here we've we've got this in Revelation 12. It's more about spiritual warfare than it's a sign for the rapture or anything. So um, that this war that began in heaven is mostly what you can see that's happened here because he's, John is setting up this whole thing about you got Israel, and you've you've we've had the two witnesses and. The dragon. Okay, now he's in chapter 11. He's going, okay, let me back up here and show you what, how this came about. And so in chapter 12, he's kind of going and picking up the loose ends. As you have to with any narrative, whether it's a movie or a book, you can't always show parallel both things happening at the same time. So um, this is one of those meanwhile back at the ranch type of moments that um, some people allude to sometimes, like in the old radio serial programs where you've got the Lone Ranger and Tonto, and you've got Lone Rangers over here, Tonto's over there, and they've got two different things going at once. So they show somebody tied to a tree over here and getting beaten up by the black hats. And then meanwhile, back at the ranch, you've got something else going on, and somebody's gathering the white hats, and they're going to go rescue this buddy. 
this is this kind of a deal. You got a narrative. You got some stuff going on in chapter eleven. Got to pick chapter twelve. John's got to pull some more together, and then chapter thirteen, he goes more into the beast and the beast system. So I hope I'm making that that much clear there as far as that goes. So anyway, um, so out of all of that, out of all this chapter, people are making much hay over this whole thing about um, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. So, um, and there is, allegedly there is this asteroid that's coming in, and I believe it, um, this September, and it's called Child, Asteroid Child. Oh, this is it. This is a big sign from chapter 12. Well, is it? Let's take a look and see. Now, what we're told about Child is we are told that, you know, wow, why is it named child? Okay. Child, the, the lady who discovered this named it after another, I think it was an astrophysicist named, I think it's James Child. You can look it up and see, Google it, it'll come up. She named it after somebody she knows or, or whatever, a colleague. So um, what happens is now, so we have this asteroid that she saw. Now, Part of the story that's out there from one particular Bible teacher out there who I, well, I won't name, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody or anything, but he says this was discovered back in the 1920s. No, I believe she discovered this asteroid back in like 1989 maybe or the early 90s. Um, and it has been up there all this time and it hasn't moved and now it's getting ready to come in and move and it's going to come into the through the head of the woman and it's going to go through and pass through her body and it's going to be del the delivery of a child. So this is the sign and it's on this date, I think the 19th. So this is when it's all going to happen. Um, and it's a sign from God. Well, first of all, it's been, it wasn't discovered back in the 1920s. It was discovered really recently, but be that as it may. Um, and no, it hasn't been just hovering out there unnoticed and, and not moving for all these years. It actually makes a circuit, something like um, it comes by, the same path every 4.27 years or something like that. So it's been here many times before in your lifetime and mine. And here's the other thing, though, that also, um, you know, like I said, I'm not trying to disillusion anybody or, and make anybody sad or whatever and, and discourage anybody. Now, I, this stuff's happening and it's going to happen, but I, I don't think it's for this reason. I mean, this asteroid is not even visible to the naked eye. I mean, you could probably track it with NASA software. If you've got some really awesome telescope material and software to track it, you might get a camera on it. You might get a, be able to get a beat on it, but it's not even going to leave a trail like a comet does where you can track it and watch it and go, ooh, ah, that's not going to happen. It's invisible to the naked eye. But people are making much hay about, look at this child. It's going to go through, and it's going to go through the woman, and it's going to be delivered on this day. And I know it's a sign. Well, signs... Biblical signs aren't usually invisible, are they? I mean, it's not a sign if it's invisible. Yeah, it's visible with special software, but really, most of the world, and I'm saying like, I bet you, even here in the United States and in Europe, I would be surprised if even 5% of the population has software where they could pull it up and look and find child and look at it and whatever. So is that really a sign? Now, what about the rest of the world who doesn't have all the computers and the sophistication of the software, or even know to look for it because it's not visible? That's like having, um, you know, the, the Christmas star be invisible. It's up there. We just can't see it. It's a star to find for the three wise men, really? Because they say it's up there, but I don't, I don't see anything. So that's not the way signs usually work. I'm just saying, I could be wrong. Um, no, it could be just an indicator. Maybe that is the date. But I will point out again that September 17th through 19th, whatever, this period we're in, we're still in summer all the way up till September 22nd. It, we don't have official day one of um, autumn the autumnal equinox until September 22, 23. That's when the sun and moon cross the equatorial plane in the way they do every year. And it'll stay where it crosses over until we get the vernal or spring equinox 
back in like March, April. Okay. So, um, I, I just, I don't want people to get up to September 19th, September 20th, September 22, and be disappointed and go, oh, not this year. He's never going to come. Well, Jesus is going to come. I'm just saying we don't know exactly. And you, it's not wise to put a lot of stock into all of that because we just simply do not know um, exactly what year. Now, yes, I believe Yom Teruah could be it. Now, I've heard people say that, well, I believe in a, a spring rapture and it's going to be right around this season. Well, I would point out, that's great. Could be right. But I would point out that the other feast days, there's seven feast days, Leviticus 23, that are the feasts of the Lord, not Jewish feast days. These are the Lord's feast days. They were all fulfilled by Christ to the day, not an approximation of it was in the right month. It was to the day he fulfilled all of the other feast days, including Pentecost, right? So he fulfilled these. Um, so why would all of a sudden Yom Teruah, um, we even know to the day as far as Yom Teruah, which day it will be. It'll be the second day of celebration because the last trump or the last trumpet, the Tekiah Gedola, is the last trumpet blown or you know, 100 trumpet blasts over a two-day period. The last trump is the last trump, so it'd be on the second day. We also have language in the scripture too about him coming at midnight or the master when he comes, you know, a lot of times he comes at midnight. This is also part of the Hebrew wedding tradition that when the bridegroom comes very often, just as a bit of fun, the father will send him to go take your bride at about midnight. And so you've got the bridesmaids or the virgins, like in the story of the 10 virgins, you have the virgins waiting out and they're kind of watching, waiting for lights, sitting for the, the shout that always happens. And the, the shofar blast that always happens. Um, and that's the Galilean wedding tradition in particular. And um, so they're, they're watching and they're waiting because they know it's been, usually that process takes about a year. Um, now, I don't know how you're going to take that one year now that it, they usually do this where the bridegroom will go off to his father's house and prepare a place. And usually it takes about a year. Uh, you know, people will again take the symbolism and try to make it well, gee, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. No, let's see. No, well, that's the year 1000. That's not going to work. But people will try to apply the funny math and try to make it something that the scripture is not explicit on. So that's where I want to caution you not to do that. It's interesting to look at and kind of say, hmm, can we, can we derive something from that? That's fine. I do it. I want to look at, you know, look for a pattern or whatever and kind of say, that's good. You know, that's kind of fun. But you, you shouldn't preach it, you know, and it, it ain't gospel, as they say. Um, so I just want to caution you, caution you about this asteroid child, um, that it's it, these kinds of things, when they come up, they're kind of interesting to look at and say, hmm, you know, and I did, and I did did the legwork, and I, I went and researched and find out, is it really what this person says it is? You know, he wouldn't lie, would he? You know, and he, he says, this isn't just a coincidence. Um, but you didn't get all the information. So, so look, don't take my word for it. Be as the Bereans, as Paul cautioned. Um, be as the Bereans and do all the legwork and, and, uh, and find out. So um, I believe the next feast day to be fulfilled since they've all happened in sequential order so far that we have the next one in, in order that has not been directly fulfilled by Christ yet has been um, Feast of Trumpets. Now, some people will say, well, that was the day Jesus was born. And I don't know where you get that. Um, could be. I've heard other people say that it was, you know, um, tabernacles. Because I will tabernacle, I will dwell with you. So some people say, no, he was born on Feast of Tabernacles. So we, we don't know exactly. We, we know it was a, getting to be cold at night. So it was in the autumn. Um, but... And some people will swear, no, he actually was born December 25th. And they'll come up with all these permutations to demonstrate that. So I'm not here to get into all that right now. But I'm just saying, um, there's an old saying that if you torture the data enough, it'll tell you what you want to hear. So um, try not to do that. Try to keep it biblical. 
So I'm going to um, cut this part of it off here and um, then I'll probably make another video because there's more to talk about and that is post-tribulationism where very popular right now to teach that the church is going through all that tribulation period or most of it but um, and that's pre-wrath but very popular is post-tribulation. We're going to go all the way through and we get raptured at the second coming. So we'll we'll look, take a quick look at that next time. And and uh, there's a couple of problems with that, biblical problems, and I'm not just, just guessing. It's biblical and logical problems, how how's that going to work? And, and I'll show you why. So enjoy the rest of your day. Be blessed. Keep looking up. Um, Jesus is coming soon one way or another, and I, I like you. I hope it's this year. I hope it's sooner rather, rather than later. Um, I'm dubious about the September date. I've expressed this before because this September, it's, it's not even, um, we're not even into autumn until September 22nd. And the next um, new moon, which remember Yom Teruah is the only feast day that is on a new moon instead of on a full moon. The next new moon after September 22nd is not even until October 14th and 15th. You know, where that big eclipse is that comes across the U.S. I think that's interesting. I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, you've got these, uh, if you, if the way the ecliptic is supposed to, the eclipse is supposed to eclipse a bunch of cities, seven or eight cities, all called Salem or Peace. But that's here in the United States. It's great. But, you know, Bible prophecy um, most of the time is about Israel. The United States isn't really in there. So it's about Israel. So, um, yeah. So I don't know how this eclipse that's crossing the United States on October 14th or 15th, you know, does it mean, does it spell doom for the United States? Well, I guess we'll find out. We know biblically, prophetically, that the whole world is doomed anyway, Revelation 3.10, because there is trouble coming in Revelation 3.10, coming upon the whole world is what Jesus said. But you, the faithful church, he told the church of Philadelphia, I'm going to rescue. Is there a rescue? Yes, there is. Jesus says, I'm going to rescue. Um, Terio Eck, I'm going to yank you up before the train even comes down the tracks. I'm not going to snatch you away at the last minute. I'm going to keep you from ever even being in any kind of a danger at all. That's what Terry Oak is. I'm not going to keep you through it. I'm not going to make the train magically, you know, run through you and then miss you. I'm not going to lift you up above it and put you back down. I'm, Terry Oak is, I'm going to completely remove you from any danger at all. Re Revelation 3.10. is it's trouble that's coming upon the whole world. And, um, and it's going to come upon all who dwell on the earth. It's going to come upon those who dwell upon the earth. Revelation 23.10. So who are those who dwell upon the earth? Well, if we're dwelling upon the earth, if we're the church, we're dwelling upon the earth, we're going through the tribulation. But he says, I'm going to rescue you and keep you from that. It's coming upon the whole world, and I'm, I'm going to keep you from this trouble that comes upon those who dwell upon the earth. Don't take my word for it. Again, Revelation 3.10. Go through and read that yourself and try to figure out how does that happen. And if we're not earth dwellers, then, and there's no rapture until the end of the tribulation, then where do we go? Space shuttle's going to take us all to the moon? Just Christians? See, there's some issues there that you've got to resolve. Most people will, will run in terror and flee and argue and hair on fire stuff before they'll ever admit that, no, you're not, you're a heretic, you're not reading it right, you know. Just try to be real with the scriptures. Try to properly exegete scripture. Do not put stuff into it that isn't there. And don't just try to erase that whole verse because it doesn't fit your paradigm, okay? Anyway, I'm, I'm trying to duck out of here. And so now I'm going to do it because I can talk all day. Have a blessed day.